So in this course, what I do is I use this hypothetical story to help try to organize all the material. And it's about how a society should think about how to run its economy, how to allocate resources. And the idea is that it's the distant future and some group of 100 colonists have traveled across the stars and arrived on a un previously unknown planet. Uh, it's habitable. There's no intelligent life anywhere on it. And humans have landed and they're going to figure out how to live, how to share the resources and how to, you know, uh, like basically how to set up a new kind of society. It's a blank slate, and so they don't have to use the old ways things were done in the past on Earth. Uh, so they don't have to use a market. They don't have to use uh, a government that like what we have. They can rethink everything and start over. And so the first problem they have when they arrive is figuring out how are they going to allocate the scarce resources they have. They've got 100 colonists who came, and these guys can they are all fit. They can do labor. And they brought with them 50 different robots, machines that can uh, also help and work. But And then they've also got all of the expansive, untapped natural resources of the planet, some of which might be scarce, some of which might be plentiful. And they need to figure out how to take this stuff, combine it, and you know, put go to work on it and get some of the stuff they want. And the first stuff that they really want, when they came to this new world, they've been living on this ship for, I don't know, 100 years or something. They want some better food and they want to have some shelter. They want more room than being in this cramped shelter. So how are they going to use those resources to attain the things they want as people, food and shelter? Okay. Fortunately, they've got this computer on board and the computer has uh, a database of every kind of technique known to mankind about how to make food and shelter from any different possible set of natural resources we ever had. And in this unit, we're basically going to talk about how economists think about that kind of problem. How do you handle production processes, transforming things like capital, I'm sorry, like machinery, labor, uh, product, natural resources into stuff people want? And the way economists do this, and we'll assume this is sort of how the supercomputer encodes this stuff in its data sets, is they use production functions, okay? A production function is a fancy name for a technology for transforming a set of inputs into an output, okay? And this is what economists use. And typically, these things are going to be like a math function. So we're going to have something like, uh, we'll end up having a function, oops, not there, like a function of x will give you y, where the y is the output and x is an input, okay? And normally we're going to have more than one input. The two main inputs that economists have found it really useful to divide uh, divide the set of possible inputs into are labor and capital. And this is a great simplification, okay? So what are each of these things? You know, when you think about how do you make stuff, what it really is is it's this process of taking physical goods, performing, you know, transformations on them, combining them, and then you get something out of the other. That's really complicated and more detail and more complications than we really need to study the process, okay? So the art of economics is to simplify as much as you can uh, without losing the important thing, okay, like that gives you the insight. So instead of thinking about all the possible inputs, like what kind of soil are these guys going to use to make uh, farm, you know, to make uh, food? What kind of, how much water are they going to apply? How much fertilizer? How much of, you know, this and that? When are they going to turn it? You know, all this other stuff. We just simplify all that and we say, all right, that's all known. It's listed in, like the process of steps is known and listed. And what we really care about is focusing on how do you get more food if you apply more of some inputs and more or, you know, and how much more do you get, okay? And instead of tracking all those different possible kind of inputs, we usually break it into just these two components because this is what we really, we find that this is pretty useful to focus on these two. Labor, and that's, you know, time spent by workers uh, to help produce a product, okay? And you can see that even just taking it as labor, that's already a huge simplification because there's tons of different kinds of laborers in the real world. There's people who uh, are salespeople, there's managers, there's HR people, there's, 
you know, manufacturing line people, there's people who are doing tons and tons of different jobs. But in economics, you know, in this course especially, what we're really going to do is we're just going to lump that all up and just sort of like one number, the amount of labor you have. And you can think of it as measuring either the number of workers who are working on this pro project or working on this uh, to produce this output, or you can think of it as the amount of time, like the number of hours of labor you've purchased or not even purchased, just are using to produce this good. And we're going to just collapse all the different kind of labor into just one number, the amount of labor you have, okay? And that's normally going to be uh, denoted with the letter L, okay? Makes sense. Where's my cursor here? Now, it's not just labor that makes stuff. We also, as humans, we have the advantage over our animal cousins that we have machines and tools that can make us, that can greatly extend our ability to do things, okay? There's so many different kinds of technologies and machines. There's like as many different uh, kinds of technologies and machines and tools as there are, you know, like human beings. Uh, but we're gonna forget all about that complexity and we're just gonna say, it's all lumped together into one number called capital. That's like the amount of machines you've got. So in the example that I use throughout this course, I assume that there's like 100 laborers. Those are the colonists who came to this planet, and that's the supply you've got to work with when you're deciding how many laborers should work on making food or shelter or other things. And they've got 50 robots. And in the real world, there would be like different kinds of robots, maybe different tools. But here, we're just going to say, you know, you've got 50 units of capital. Now, we use the letter L to represent labor. You'd think we would use the letter C to represent capital. We can't. We're instead going to use the letter K. Where's my thing here? And that's because the letter C is already taken for another place in economics to represent cost. Okay, so capital is represented by the capital letter K. Now, three major simplifications that we've done so far. The actual process of producing goods is a series of steps that can take many different paths. It can be like a branching tree, so do this, then this, then this, then this, then this, and if this happens, do this, and if that happens, do that. All of that complexity, we just say, forget about it. It's just a math equation that says if you've got this much labor and this much capital, you're gonna do the process and it will generate this much output, okay? Second major simplification, tons of different kinds of laborers and so, so on, and we're just gonna, tons of different kinds of laborers and even capital, and we're just gonna lump them into these two categories, L and K. Third major simplification, there's other stuff that's not tools or machinery, but is still used in production, all right? Like you use energy to run things, you use uh, soil to grow, you know, use land to grow food, you use natural resources that you harvest. And in this case, we just completely ignore those. Now, this is because I'm teaching a course and trying to give you the big picture, and these are some of the most important things we need to know. But the art of economics is simplifying as much as you can and still retaining the core things that you're trying to study, the sort of core insights. And if you're studying problems where these other things are important, like if you're studying a problem about how people manage other people or you're studying a problem about how natural resources are used, then you just don't do that, okay? You don't make those simplifications. I'm sorry. You still study the problem, but you don't make the simplifications that I've made. And in fact, these production functions are totally flexible. These are the two that we're going to focus on here, capital and labor. So we're going to have a lot of production functions that look like this. You have capital, you have a function of capital and labor, and it generates an output, often represented by the letter Q. But if you are studying a problem where this is inappropriate, you can add other complexity to it. So instead of just L, L will say labor managers and labor uh, line workers, or sort of we can say unskilled labor maybe. And maybe you also need to add in electricity, that's important. You can just keep adding stuff, okay? So the reason that we don't do this stuff in the course is not because it's not important, but it's just not important for uh, teaching you Econ 301 right now. And the insights that we get from just studying capital and labor and having two things are gonna be pretty extendable, and so you'll be able to take what you learn and apply it 
uh, as needed to sort of extensions, okay? So with that instead, let's start to dig into how we describe this production process in a lot more detail, okay?